Welcome to Who's in STEM. I'm Ken Ono, your host and the STEM advisor to the Provost and the Marvin Rosenblum Professor of Mathematics at UVA. Our goal is to evoke flights of imagination and wonder by showcasing the cornucopia of all that is STEM at UVA, the marvelous world of UVA science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Now, science usually advances on the work of thousands over generations, fine-tuning and extending the scope of understanding. But from time to time, significant discoveries and inventions come along that transform the world, seemingly overnight. Let's see some examples. Well, let's start with the Neolithic invention of the wheel, a turning point in human civilization. How about the 15th century invention of the printing press, which led to the Renaissance, and of course the onset of journalism? Then in the 19th century, we had the invention of the steam engine, which drove the first industrial revolution. And, well, then there's the light bulb and the electrification of the world, the telephone, the automobile, and more recently, the discovery of DNA and the emergence of genetics. And even more recently, we have the internet. These advances are so significant that it's impossible to imagine what life would be like today had they never happened. It would be a world we would be unable to fathom. Could you imagine a world without wheels? I can't. In terms of electricity, aren't we all grumpy when the power goes out during a summer thunderstorm? Of course, as wonderful as these advances are, we have to acknowledge that these advances often come with significant unanticipated problems. One obvious example is climate change most notably the long-term shifts in weather patterns caused by human activity, largely the burning of fossil fuels that has powered the industrialization of the modern world. A response to climate change demands new policy and worldwide cooperation. So it's in this spirit that today we're talking about another modern advance. It's been in the air. We're all talking about it. It's the emergence of AI, artificial intelligence, you know some of the terms, chat GPT, large language models, and so on. There's a lot that's amazing and mind-blowing about AI. But also at the same time, a lot of that demands policy. And so it's a pleasure today to speak with Rockstar UVA Assistant Professor Mona Sloan. Dr. Sloan is an Assistant Professor of Data Science and Media Studies. You heard that right, Data Science combined with Media Studies. She has been named as one of the 100 brilliant women in AI ethics, and she is a member of the inaugural Women in Ethics Hall of Fame. Mona, welcome to Who's in STEM. Thank you so much, Ken. It is a pleasure to be here and talk to you about all things technology, society, and ethics. Our pleasure indeed. Mona, big data, chat GPT, and AI, large language models, everyone has been talking about them. Your take, what is AI and how is it changing the world mostly for the better? Ooh, starting off with a big question here, Ken. <laughs> and probably the most important one we're going to talk about today, I suppose. So first off, I kind of want to front load that I think that AI has really vast potential in supporting us in the bureaucratic work that we are all enrolled in as part of running our personal lives or doing our jobs. So personally, I'm pretty excited about the prospect of using AI to help me organize my files, craft emails, or doing things like writing research protocols for my lab. Now, what is AI? Well, we still have no agreement on that definition, but the idea of intelligent machines is not new. It's been around for a very long time. Researchers at the University of Cambridge in the UK have demonstrated that imaginative thinking about intelligent machines is really as old as 2,000 years. It first showed up in Homer's Iliad. Oh, is that right? Yeah, that's actually right. I actually didn't like reading that in college. That was like a nightmare for me. <laughs> likewise, likewise. So I'm, I'm pleased that they did that work for us. So what they say is that we always associate hopes and fears with intelligent machines. And we typically do that in a polarized way. So we either think about an AI future that is utopian or dystopian. 
And we sometimes ascribe quasi-magical capabilities to AI. And we still get caught up in those extremes. And we're really seeing that in the public discourse surrounding generative AI, the sort of new kid on the AI block, which I'm sure you will ask me about later. Yeah, absolutely. Now, the problem is that our fears and excitements distract us from understanding what AI really is or how it works. So I like to underline that AI is a field of computer science. That means that technically, we can distinguish between rule-based and learning-based AI. The former is given a set of rules, for example, chess rules, and it learns how to play best by those rules. An applied example is algorithmic trading or the Roomba vacuum cleaner that learns the layout of your apartment. Now, the latter, the learning AI, is not given instructions and detects pattern by itself and makes decisions based on those patterns. So, for example, product preferences on shopping websites that serve as a basis for decisions about what content is displayed to users. Now, machine learning and deep learning techniques, which ignite the current AI summer that we're seeing, is learning-based AI. Now, for a little less than a year, we have a new version of that learning AI that has rattled all of us. Said generative AI, your chat GPT, your Claude, and so on. Now, as I said, generative AI is learning AI too, but rather than just identifying patterns and suggesting or making decisions based on these patterns, generative AI, well, generates new data. Yeah, where did it come from? Where did it come yeah. from? It's magic. <laughs> Or so we think. Now, at a high level, generative models encode simplified representation of their training data and draw from it to create a new work that is similar but not identical to the original data when prompted. So that's really important. And I'm sure you and our listeners are mostly familiar with that technology on an everyday basis at this point in time. I'm sure we have all played around in some shape or form with the generative AI tools that are out there on the market. So I think these are quite helpful ways for understanding what AI quote unquote is coming at it on the one hand from the narratives and the stories that we tell each other and on the other through the technical ways in which AI works. Well, that's a super answer, Mona. Thank you very much for sharing this well-crafted description of AI as, as, as we've come to know it. So you're well known for your work in the ethics of AI. What are the ethical problems that worry you and perhaps the ones that should worry us all? Yeah, Ken, another big question here today. <laughs> well, <laughs> you're, you. you're going to give us the answers. Oh, I hope. <laughs> I'm, I'll try my best. Thank you for asking that. So, well, for me, the biggest ethical problem with AI is that AI is a scaling technology. It is designed to do more things faster with less human judgment involved. So that means that it can also scale the awful features of our society, discrimination, oppression, harm, and so on. Now, over the past years, we have seen ample evidence from researchers, from affected communities and activists, of AI systems inflicting real world harms. For example. Yeah, examples, yeah. Absolutely. Example, we know that AI-driven facial recognition technology used in law enforcement has led to wrongful arrests. We know that algorithmic risk prediction tools for social services produce higher risk scores for poor minority women. And we know that computer vision applications broadly can fail at much higher rates for women than for men and for individuals with darker skin than lighter skin. Now, as you can see, the risk of experiencing this AI harm is not the same for everyone. It maps onto well-known fault lines of social stratification. Now, we could say, hey, we've got this new kid on the AI block, generative AI. What about that? Well, generative AI has issues, too. For example, the generative AI tool Midjourney has been proven to be incapable 
of producing images of black doctors treating white children, regardless of the prompt, which of course reinforces harmful global health tropes. That's fresh research that came out just a couple of weeks ago. Mm. Another issue that we are probably intimately familiar with at this point is the problem of hallucinations caused by generative AI. So in April 2023, generative AI had just come onto the market. A lawyer was fined for submitting fictional precedent cases to the court as part of a briefing he filed. He had used OpenAI's generative system, ChatGPT, to find cases that were related to the lawsuit he had filed on behalf of his client. Now, the system dutifully complied, and he even asked the system if these were real cases. The system confirmed, said, yes, yes, they are. But the opposing legal team was unable to find these cases anywhere. They were then revealed to be hallucinations, fiction. So how do you hold ChatGPT responsible, right? A kid might say, oops, I'm so sorry, uh, but for issues that are this sophisticated, where's the accountability? And that is one of the biggest questions we're asking right now in research. That is one of the biggest um, issues that is keeping regulators up at night, that is also keeping tech companies up at night, um, and that really connects back to the question, what kind of technology is AI and is generative right. AI. If a computer gives you an answer, there's this level of trust. A computer gave you the answer. It's not going to be prejudiced. It's like adding one plus one to give you two. There's no other answer. How do we fight back against that? I guess that gets to uh, one of the central uh, questions that you study in your research. So in your work in AI ethics, you address these problems. Tell us about maybe some specific examples of your work to give us, uh, you know, a glimpse of of what you do here. Yeah, happily. So I'm a sociologist by training, and that means that my main interest is in understanding how AI gets embedded into the organization of social life. And I'm particularly interested in the issues I just illustrated and that you just brought up, of mm -hmm. course, mm -hmm. the ways in which AI can amplify social stratification. Now, as part of that, I like to think of AI as social infrastructure. I think at this point, we are typically unable to see and understand the ways in which AI has become embedded into social processes, into our everyday life, into the way in which we relate to one another. It's kind of just there in the background and that is increasingly happening as AI gets embedded into all sorts of software systems and hardware systems that we routinely use. Well, and it's impossible to tell when it's there. Exactly. Now, that's actually similar to the grid or roads. It's become infrastructural. Right. Now, infrastructures tend to become visible when they break down. And I think that an AI breakdown is the occurrence of an AI harm, like the ones I just described, a wrongful arrest or higher risk scores and so on. So a lot of my research is investigating these breakdowns and their relationship to wider social organization. For example, I currently work with the terrific Dr. Alison Kienicke at Cornell and Hilke Shellman at NYU on understanding how AI-driven speech-to-text transcription tools may systematically mess up for people with speech impairment and folks with oh. aphasia specifically. Now, that's ongoing. We've got a paper under review, so look, oh, okay. look out for that. Um, I'm also very interested in how normative assumptions get baked into AI systems and can cause these harms. So another project I currently work on with Dr. Emmanuel Moss at Intel and Dr. Abigail Jacobs at the University of Michigan is on understanding how normative assumptions around bodies have shaped motion capture technology, which is AI-driven, and how these assumptions continue to heavily influence how we do innovation in motion capture at large. So both the speech project and the motion capture project are AI audit projects, so they get at the question of how can we make AI more accountable. And they are designed to compare how a system ought to work with how it actually works and impacts people. So that's sort of the AI accountability 
uh, work that I do. Another important aspect of my research is focused on understanding the intersection of professional practice and AI. So how do people in their jobs use AI, make sense of AI systems as part of doing their uh, regular tasks, just, you know, doing their job. And I'm particularly interested in high stakes jobs where expert decision making is integral to the identity of that profession. And there are two areas that I focus on. The first one is on AI and recruiting. And I've been working with HR professionals to figure out Mm. what AI tools they use, how they use them, and specifically how they use them for finding candidates and making decisions about candidates. And I've just received the UVA Darden and Data Science Collaboratory Fellowship for Applied Data Science to expand that work. I'm super excited Mm -hmm. uh, about that. And then I run another research project that asks sort of the same question, but in the context of journalism. Now, Mm -hmm. in my lab, We are researching how journalists use AI in their work. And that project is a collaboration with NYU's Hilke Shellman and MacRock. MacRock is a nonprofit that provides a repository of hundreds of thousands of pages of original government materials and information and um, provides information how to file FOIA requests and Mm -hmm. making the process easier. Now, we will use the research that I am conducting together with one of my graduate assistants to improve Gumshoe. Gumshoe is a natural language processing tool that we built when I was back at NYU, um, which helps journalists comb through these large troves of unstructured data for the investigations. And Gumshoe was actually Uh, implemented into MockRock and is currently being used by journalists. So we're going to make sure that we can make this better. A third thing I'm sort of working on is AI policy. On the one hand, I conduct research on how regulators are working to put guardrails around AI here in the U.S., but also in Europe and in Canada and other places. But I also support them in doing so in various ways. Oh, that's, that's that's wonderful. What I like about uh, your portfolio of activities is, is not only its breadth in terms of the different areas in which you're conducting your work, but it's but it's bigger than that. On the one hand, the work that you call auditing it's very important, right? Because you know that's what we do in science, right? Two steps forward, one back. To you, you continually learn from your mistakes to improve systems. But on the other hand, you're also using this research to help uh, inform policymakers to to mitigate the risks of introducing harmful things because of your experience. So that that you're doing both policy work as well as auditing work is really to be commended. So I do want to say that I'm dumbfounded here. You mentioned four or five different projects with researchers worldwide. I'm also aware that you run your lab, the the Sloan Lab, and I just have to wonder, how does this all work? How do you manage this lab so that you can successfully undertake all of these all of these projects? Tell us about the lab, right? It, for most listeners, the term lab probably conjures images of test tubes, telescopes, so on and so forth. What is what does the Sloan Lab look like? Ha, that's a great question, um, and I love that you put it that way. So I'm a social scientist, and as you said, you know, social scientists do not necessarily run labs or have labs. That's more of more of a STEM thing. Um, but and I also like you use the word collaboratory. Maybe we can also talk about what that means. Absolutely, yeah. So Sloan Lab is my research group, and what we're trying to do is we are trying to really push the boundaries of social science involvement in applied questions and applied research questions around AI. So we are in some way fighting the stereotype that social science is sort of only theory building in the ivory tower, um, high level. We are quite involved. We are, as you say, extremely collaborative. So we have uh, collaborators in different places in the world, um, in different places within UVA and beyond UVA. But we are um, organized around four strategic research areas. One is AI accountability, so the audit work I just mentioned. Mm -hmm. 
The second one is the other one I mentioned, AI and professional practice or mm -hmm. AI in the professions. The third one I also mentioned is AI and policy. And mm -hmm. the fourth one is public scholarship and public uh, engagement with the public and different publics, uh, including policymakers. So the work that I described earlier falls into these areas. So we're small, but we're growing um, we are at the moment eight graduate students and one undergraduate student. That's not um, small. Yeah, but okay. <laughs> right, right. Um, and a bunch of collaborators. I should say, you know, I have uh, principal investigators who are co-principal investigators and in projects, um, and we are managing these projects uh, together. So your graduate students, some are in the College of Arts and Sciences, and some are in the, the School of Data Science. They span the, the two schools? Correct. Um, like me, they are uh, split across the, oh, the, 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 the UVA footprint, yeah. and not, but not even all of them are at UVA. So um, oh. I just got to UVA, so I'm new, so I brought uh, broad collaborations and RAs with me. They're quite spread out. One is actually in London in the UK, um, two are in Ithaca, Two are in New York City, one's in Seattle, and three are here at UVA. Um, they are all pretty deeply involved in the research. Um, so they are, on the one hand, deeply involved in data collection, involved in data analysis, involved in writing out the work for scientific publications, for public output, and so on. But they're also participating in the daily life of the lab. So meetings, organizing our uh, public presentation, making sure that we are up to speed with all the many things that are going on in the world of AI uh, and so on. Folks help me with a lot of the public scholarship that I am doing. That can include background research, outreach, maintaining our website, everything. Everything that involves these four strategic research areas um, that we have. I probably forget half of what we do in Stone Lab. There is more and we get busier by the day, which I love. I'm a dynamic and active person and I love to keep busy. <laughs> yeah. um, I want to say, though, that I'm currently recruiting with my two co-PIs and Darden McIntyre for a postdoc um, for the recruiting and AI project. So we're looking for somebody who is a pro in qualitative research, if you are that pro, uh, please reach out to me. So what sort of credentials are you looking for in this postdoc? So a, a PhD scholar, uh, in, are there specific fields of expertise you're looking for? We are looking for somebody um, who has social science mm -hmm. training. We are looking for somebody who is really good at running qualitative interviews, semi-structured interviews, mm. qualitative mm -hmm. data analysis, who has experience in participant observation, and who is good at and enjoys the writing up of work and who is um, dynamic and can slot right into the dynamic life in the lab. So for our listeners, if that describes you or someone you know, send Dr. Sloan an email. She is growing her lab. Thank you, Ken. Yes, so, I am. So I'd like to uh, shift gears a little bit for a moment, just focus a bit more on what we're doing on grounds here at UVA. Uh, you are actively involved in the Karsh Institute for Democracy and Digital Technology, something we're very proud of here at the University of Virginia. Uh, it's one of the major units we support out of the provost's office. So tell us about your work with the Institute. Why does it matter? And what are you doing as a faculty lead? Yeah, I'm very fortunate to be a faculty lead at the Digital Technology and Democracy Lab at Kosh. Um, amongst many stellar colleagues who I much admire, I'm in awe of the folks who are here at UVA and who also do terrific work. And I really enjoy um, hanging out with them and exchanging notes and ideas on sort of a almost everyday basis. Um, our work in that lab is focused on building up interdisciplinary research and public scholarship and engagement on a very important question. And that's the question of how we can strengthen democracy in the age of pervasive digital systems such as AI. Now, yeah, this matters. That, yeah, just yeah, a little this, bit. This totally matters, Tiny bit. Right? Yeah. Now, as the faculty cohort, um, we are currently busy 
with recruiting a substantial group of postdocs who are working on that question in their own work. We just completed the first round of interviews and making offers, and we will welcome seven postdocs in the fall. So that's a big group that we're extremely excited about, and they are coming from everywhere. So it's a, it's a global group. Their work is extremely exciting. Uh, it ranges from exploring the intersection of technology, building construction and the climate emergency to questions of gender violence and technology policy and other very important issues. Mm -hmm. It's been a lot of fun um, doing that work and putting together this group. And I'm super excited about working with these young scholars over the next two years. And so next year, we will uh, welcome the next cohort. So we're building up the group and they, they'll they each be with us for two years. So that's sort of the, the stuff that we're doing together as a cohort, as a faculty cohort. What will the output be? So the idea is that we are building out, on the one hand, scholarly prowess, I suppose, on that issue and on that question. But the we're not stopping there. The idea or the driver, I should say, is to get that work out and deeply engage with communities on that question and on these specific questions and topics that these postdocs are investigating and interested in. So um, community involvement, stakeholder involvement um, is really key. And we made that central to what we asked of them in the application. So they're all coming with that sort of community engagement, stakeholder engagement, muscle flexed, if you right, will. Right. So for our listeners, if you're not aware of the Karsh Institute, you will be hearing more and more from them. It's, as I mentioned, one of the exciting initiatives that the university uh, is supporting. It's headed by Laurent Dubois, also a new faculty member new to, the, to UVA, and this is work that matters. So Mona, as hard as it will be for our listeners to believe, you do even more than you've described. Uh, in, my, in my role, I'm in meetings all the time, and you're one of the names that just seems to come up over and over and over again. What else do you do, not just here at UVA, but in the world? What is the world of Dr. Sloan? What else does it include? Well, first of all, I hope you only hear good things. Um, <laughs> you never Same know. Same here, if I ever come up. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so I actually want to mention one project that is part of Karsh that I sort of run in my individual role as a faculty lead that is UVA specific, but is designed to um, push beyond UVA eventually. And that is the student technology project. Um, back in November, um, when President Biden signed the executive order on uh, safe, secure, and trustworthy AI, I published an op-ed in the Times Higher Education and saying, well, it's leaving out an important technology governance question and stakeholder group, which is students. Yeah, I um, mean... I think that's incredible that that got left out, but go yeah, on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I call in that op-ed for the establishment of a student technology council at universities at large. I think students need to have a voice in decision-making about what technologies are procured and used on campuses and how they're being governed, especially in the age of AI, where data collection today can actually impact your future in five years, 10 years, 15 years. So this is really important. Um, and students are, after all, experts in their own learning and their own lives. So I think that's a very important issue. I also think that UVA is uniquely suited to being the sandbox for that because we have such a strong legacy in student governance through the honor system and mm -hmm. through very, very active right. student groups here on grounds. So I'm extremely thrilled that Slonab is collaborating with the Karsh Institute of Democracy on making that happen or trying to make that happen. Um, so that work or that project will be research-based. I don't like to do things that are not um, based on research. I think 
that's extremely important. So um, the project will be research-based and st stakeholder-driven. Um, we'll start off with researching histories and ex uh, existing practices of student and technology governance at universities generally and UVA specifically. And then we'll begin to deeply engage with the key stakeholders that we identified and co-design the Student Technology Council. And hopefully one day, will be able to launch it. So I'm super thrilled that I just hired a undergraduate research assistant who is extremely talented to help with that work. She has technical knowledge, but wants to become a policymaker. So she's very well suited uh, to help me with that. And we are, you know, if you are interested in, in that project, do reach out as well. We are just starting out. She just came on board. So we are in the process of trying to understand what's what, who's who on grounds with regards to governance, student groups, and technology concerns. This is all extraordinary. Our time is running short. We could keep going, I'm sure. But one last question. I'd like to ask my guests to tell a bit about their personal history, their personal stories, their career paths, perhaps. As data science and certainly the AI, ethics of AI, as that is all so new, uh, I doubt very much that you dreamt of a career in these fields as a child. Tell us a bit about your story. There must be an unlikely path that somehow led you to this work. Where does it all begin? <laughs> yeah, um, it is unlikely, I think. So <laughs> when I was very, very little, I wanted to be Robin Hood, and then I wanted to be a Formula One Wait, you driver. You, be, you said you want to be Robin Hood? Correct, yeah. With the felt cap and the... Bone and arrow? The, absolutely. No. <laughs> Fight, okay. Fighting right. for the force. So, um, well, you still do that. I still yeah. do. I, yeah. That's what I'm trying to get yeah. at. So yeah. there's like certain themes, okay. I guess, okay. in my okay. life that yeah. keep resurfacing. Um, I grew up in Cologne in Germany as the daughter of a Brit and a German. And when I sort of was about 10 uh, years old, it became clear to me that I really, really wanted to become a professional ballerina. And I joined Cologne Ballet Academy um, and trained intensely uh, as an athlete for many years there. But I was always really interested in school and intellectual work. Um, and then when I graduated, I decided not to pursue that anymore, but to, um, first of all, take a gap year. That's quite common, actually, mm -hmm. in Germany and, and Europe. This and is out of gymnasium, isn't that what they call correct. high school gymnasium, gymnasium, right? So gymnasium is 13 years of oh, education. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, I then spent five years in Japan as an au pair. Um, and then really? I did, yeah, in Kobe. It was fun with a German family. Um, then got ready for going to college and um, ended up at a tiny social science-focused private university in the south of Germany called Zeppelin University, which was all about interdisciplinary work, which was really appealing to me, still is. Mm -hmm. From there, I went to the London School of Economics and completed a master's degree in uh, cultural sociology and a PhD in sociology. And I was very interested in bodies and movement and space mm -hmm. and ended up understanding design as something that is extremely powerful socially. Um, so the, the design of spaces and then, be, you know, I came to understand design as a social super phenomenon and um, became extremely interested in how design and inequality intersect partially by way of co-founding and running a research program on public lighting and inequality. Um, and public I, lighting. Okay. Public lighting, yeah. So nighttime lights on, um, which has everything to do with technology and surveillance, uh, especially uh, in the UK where um, social housing estates are uh, light polluted and uh, over surveilled. And from there was a very short way to technology and inequality. And at that point in time, we had a huge AI hype going on and everybody started talking about AI ethics and I became incredibly frustrated with the silver bullet narrative around AI ethics yeah, right. uh, and philosophers sort of coming out and having them <laughs> and talking about very abstract moral philosophies as sort of solutions to these problems we were starting to see and at the intersection of AI and society. And I got um, pretty upset uh, and uh, as a sociologist thought, how can you ignore things like social inequality and things like design and jumped in the deep end of AI? And I'm 
kind of still there. I've not come right. out yet. Right. Well, thank you for championing that that cause. Well, Mona, this is this has been a great conversation. One last question: What advice? I mean, your work is extraordinary. It's 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 really quite intimidating, certainly for I imagine students who might be coming to UVA. So, what advice can you offer? for students that are thinking about pursuing, say, research with you or uh, is thinking about working with CARSH or data science or media studies, you're already an iconic figure. So what advice can you offer uh, a beginning student? Thank you, Ken. I'm (laughs) I'm flattered. Um, So what I like to say when I get that question is, first and foremost, Stay curious. Mm -hmm. Um, Don't get complacent. Stay curious. Um, Be confident in making connections or seeing connections between things that others might not see and might not appreciate initially. And what I mean by that, if you have an opportunity to pursue your own research project as part of coursework, do that and explore these intersections. Try to conduct research, your own research, on current data science in AI and society questions. So that's sort of a general advice. Then, concretely, I'm always happy to talk to students. I love getting emails from students who say, hey, I'm interested in this. Can we chat? Um, I make a point of meeting with students, uh, of connecting them with folks who are already in my lab. Of um, And growing your lab, right? Correct. Yeah. Um, and also making clear that at UVA we are deeply committed to the interdisciplinary work that is required to understand the intersection of technology and society and ensure that it works for everybody. So, um be curious, be engaged, and go to the many events that we are running you oh, know, yeah. at, on grounds and that are happening beyond grounds. So there really is no excuse to not get active right away. And the field of public interest technology is growing. There, It's a, it's a growing field of careers um, within government and in private companies. And we'll see more and more jobs pop up there. So think about pursuing an internship uh, in that Um, direction and um, read, 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 read the news. There are certain outlets that do great reporting on those issues and just be sure that you're on top of what's happening. Great. Mona, your contributions to the ethics of AI, your contributions to UVA and the larger world, your impactful journey, um, it's all very inspiring. Your work aligns perfectly in an extraordinary way with President Ryan's vision for UVA to be great and good in all that we do. Thank you for your time. I'm Ken Ono, STEM advisor to the provost and the Marvin Rosenblum professor of mathematics, and you've been listening to Who's in STEM. Who's in STEM is a production of WTJU 91.1 FM and the office of the provost at the University of Virginia. Who's in STEM is produced by Katherine Kossaboom, Claire Curzan, Rhea Verma, Mary Garner-McGee, and Ariane Ballou. Our music is composed and performed by Robert Schneider and John Ferguson of Apples and Stereo. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Listen and subscribe to Who's in STEM on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. We'll be back soon with another conversation about scientific technological innovation at the University of Virginia. Thank you.